Hi, welcome everyone. I'm Melissa Scanlon. I'm the director of the Environmental Law Program, and thanks for coming to our Hot Topics lecture series. We hold these lectures every Tuesday and Thursday from noon to one throughout the summer. And uh, many of you know it's a brown bag lunch. I see you're eating your, your um, lunches, so feel free to do that. Uh, for those who are here for CLE credit, there's a sign-in at the back of the room, so you can get credit for that. Uh, we're going to start with a lecture, and then there'll be a short question and answer period at the end of the lecture that'll last about 15 minutes, and then we will let you out of here at about 5 to 1 so people can get to their classes. And in fact, the person giving the lecture today, uh, Christopher Root, is on our summer faculty and going to be teaching all afternoon, so we definitely need to end that time today. Um, so, Today I'm pleased to introduce you to Christopher Root. He has, since uh, 2014, been the Chief Operating Officer at Velco, the Vermont Electric Power Company. And prior to that position, he served as Senior Vice President of Network Strategy, a branch of National Grid. He holds a Master's in Engineering from Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute and a BS in Electrical Engineering from Northeastern University. And he's currently, as I mentioned, on our summer faculty. He's co-teaching uh, the three essentials of the electric grid. This week, he's teaching the engineering essentials piece of that course. Uh, today, he's going to be presenting about the state of Vermont transmission grid with high levels of renewable resources, which is a great follow-up to Thursday's lecture last week, where we'll transition. So, this is, you'll see there's a method to this as, as we go through the, the lectures in the series. And they're building on it. So please join me in welcoming Christopher Root. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I've got about a half an hour's worth of slides and talking, um, and then we do the Q&A. If there's something that I mentioned during it, don't be afraid to raise your hand. We can stop if you want to ask a question or a clarification. I'm uh, more than happy to answer it as we go through it. Um, my, my job at Vermont Electric um, as the Chief Operating Officer, one of the things that um, Vermont is unique is that in the Northeast is the high amount of renewable energies that quickly coming onto the grid. And to understand the impact of running a reliable electric system with those new resources coming on. So um, as the percentage of renewables increases, it creates new problems and new challenges. So I'm going to share with you about some of those challenges and some of the ways we're um, working to mitigate any of the problems that's created by that so that we can have a seamless transition from fossil burning and other types of generation to renewable energy generation. But the characteristics of renewable energy are very different from what the power system was built on over the last hundred years. So when you, whenever you try to run a power system in a different way than the engineers designed it, they get very nervous. They get very nervous and say, wait a minute, we designed it this way, if you wanna run it this way, they don't like that. They get all flustered and stuff like that. Typical conservative engineers always worry about stuff like that. And the reality of it is, if you make a big mistake on a big power system, you have a big blackout, which is a huge problem. So, and in Europe, they've had three significantly large blackouts. A couple of them were attributable to some of the high levels of renewable energy in Germany, which they didn't uh, foresee some of the potential problems and, and didn't mitigate them or fix them soon enough. So they had a couple of problems there. So, so we've learned a lot from that over the last couple of years and we've tried to make sure that, that doesn't happen in the US, but it's still um, a bone of, um, uh, just the engineers get nervous about it, so that's all. So to start off with, I just thought I would talk a little bit about what is Velco, because it is a unique company that, that in Vermont. Um, it, is the it was the first transmission-only company created just to transport energy around the state, of, uh, around the state uh, in the United States. It was created 60 years ago. And um, what happens is that uh, the transmission system in Vermont was owned by various companies, um, distribution, utilities, uh, municipals, uh, co-ops. 
they all own pieces of the transmission system, and it was run kind of in a splintered fashion. And in the 1950s, they decided to pull it all together, make one company to run all of the transmission systems. The highway system is a good analogy, right? So the interstate highway system is the transmission system. And off of the transmission, uh, off the interstate highway, you go into state highways. State highway system is called the sub-transmission system equivalent. And when you go from that to turn on to smaller roads, then you're going on to distribution circuits. So really there is a good analogy between the train as well as the electric transmission system. So think of it that way, and we basically run the interstate highway system that connects the various um, generation systems, and we move power around the state. We move it from Massachusetts, from New York, from New Hampshire, from Canada. All these sources of power going in and out of the state, we've moved that all around. So we have 700 miles of transmission in Vermont. Um, it's a uh, high voltage, so it's 115,000 volts to 345,000 volts. Uh, to do that, we have 55 substations. So think of a substation as an exit ramp. So the way you get off the, the high voltage transmission system is through a substation, and that steps down the voltage to us a lower, a lower number, a lower voltage level. And that's very similar to an exit ramp. So there's only so many exit ramps on 89, or so many on Route 91. It's the same thing, and we have 55, uh, 55 of those substations in Vermont. Um, we do get power from Canada. We have an interconnection to Canada, and that is north of Burlington um, in, the, in Highgate. So if you were to be going from Burlington to Montreal, you'd go through the town of Highgate, and then there's a converter terminal which uh, supplies about 20% uh, of the energy in Vermont comes from Canada. It comes through a converter terminal that's up there that ties to Canada. So, and, uh, and to make all this work technology-wise, we own 1,500 miles of fiber optics cables in the state of Vermont. All our substations are tied together with fiber optics, and we do a number of other things um, with the distribution companies. But basically, it's used to, to run the power system. So, uh, so we also have a fairly extensive communication system uh, behind us. So the things I'm going to talk about today about are unique to Vermont. And as you all know, those of you who've been in Vermont, Vermont is unique in many ways. So um, one thing is that um, we'll talk a little bit about is where does the power come from in Vermont? And there is no large generating plant in the state of Vermont at this point. So we'll talk a little bit about that impact um, of not having one. We're going to talk a little bit about the fact that renewables are different than, than traditional generation and how do you incorporate them. And I'll talk a little bit about that, about why weather forecasting is so important going forward. You're going to run the power system based on renewables. Renewables are based on weather. So you have to be able to reliably predict what the weather is going to be um, in the short term. Um, I'll we'll talk a little bit about some of the issues um, in Vermont that are unique and there's constraints in Vermont. And then I'll just talk about some of the kind of my thoughts about what's going to happen over the next couple of years. And I'm going to give it from a little bit from perspective of somebody who's trying to run the power system, keep, keep it reliable. And that's our number one goal is that reliable electricity delivery to everyone all the time. So this chart that I'm showing right now, and the apologies if there, I, I, um, uh, I test a little bit, basically has a couple of columns on it. Um, the first column here tells you where energy, the types of major types of energy uh, in the state of Vermont. And I just kept the state borders as the limit here, right? So this is just within the state of Vermont. So, um, so there's about 150 megawatts. So megawatts is a measure of, of uh, power or in, uh, power instantaneous measure of how much you can get out of a particular type of um, plant. So there's a lots of hydro plants in the state of Vermont. There's about 152 megawatts of that. There's probably more, way over a dozen that add up to that. There is wind in the state of Vermont. There's at least three wind farms in the state of Vermont, and they can generate when the wind's blowing, maximum amount, and there's no other constraints, 100, 120 megawatts there. There's some landfill gas, there's some bio, uh, the biomass is in a couple of different plants, the biggest one being in the city of Burlington, where they burn uh, wood chips, 
and uh, for 72 megawatts plus a couple other plants. And then there was in 2014, this is in 2014, in 2014 the nuclear plant was, was running. In 2015 that was shut down uh, at the end of 2014, so that does not operate anymore, so that goes to zero. Now in saying that, talking about these sources, um, I'm going to talk about the solar because the solar is basically about 140 megawatts now of solar and that's growing every single day quite quickly and I'll talk a little bit about that. But the, but the peak loads in Vermont in the summertime about a thousand megawatts, a little less than a thousand megawatts. So all those numbers, let's think of the number of thousand. Same thing in the wintertime, it's about the same, it's about a thousand megawatts in the wintertime. So just keep those in mind. So the, before the nuclear plant shut down, there was 1,200 megawatts of generation in the state of Vermont. And after the nuclear plant shut down, there were only 800 megawatts of power plants in the state of Vermont. So what does that matter? Well, obviously, if you don't have enough generation for the amount of load, you have to import. So that's been an issue. You have to import. So before the power plant was shut down, we actually, the state of Vermont was an exporter of power. The nuclear plant exported power out of the state most of the time, and three quarters of the time they exported um, power outside of the state of Vermont. That was when the nuclear plant was running. Now, the nuclear plant shut down, basically 84% of the time, Vermont imports more than 400 megawatts. 40% of the power in Vermont comes from outside of the state now. So that's not widely understood because everywhere you turn, you see a solar um, cell somewhere. You see a solar field or something like that. But the magnitude of what those generate during the day, when the sun's shining, is actually a, still a small amount to the overall use of electricity within the state of Vermont. So it's still, you still got a ways to go to be anywhere near energy yeah, um, um, sustained within the state of Vermont right now. Okay. Now, we do one thing we do have is we do have this uh, connection to Hydro Quebec, and we import about 220 megawatts pretty much all the time from uh, from Canada. So that's not on this list, but that's that's another. One. Okay. So so we rely on our neighbors for our power. That's the point there. So. So what does it mean when it's your peak? When is the peak in Vermont? So I said, well, let's look at 2015, right? Last year, um, when, were the, when, was, when did the highest use of electricity get used in Vermont? So the one on the left is the winter time, right? And that happened in January, even though it wasn't as cold as the year before, but it happened in January. It happened at six o'clock at night. That's when the most energy is used in the winter typically is at night, at six o'clock at night, okay? And for that reason for that, people come home, they turn up the heat, they start cooking, they start doing stuff around the house, turning on the lights because the sun's gone down. That's your peak use, okay? That's an important thing. So during that hour of that peak load, which was, it was almost 1,000 megawatts, okay, this is where the power came from in Vermont. That big loop, that three quarters slice of that high, that was imported energy from outside the state of Vermont. 200 megawatts of that was coming from Hydro-Quebec, so that was clean Hydro-Quebec, and a bunch of the other things were coming from either Massachusetts, New York, or New Hampshire. So that was going on, and then you can see the rest of it's there. There was no solar. Why? The sun went down. No sun, no solar, okay? So during the peak time, solar contributed zero. Um, it was a um, there was some water, which was good considering it's January and all the rivers were not completely frozen over. So there's 70 megawatts coming from uh, the hydro plants in the Vermont, in the state. And the good thing is, and this is a little bit unusual, but in really cold nights, it tends to be really still. When it's really still, there's no wind. But there was a little breeze that day, and there was 70 uh, megawatts uh, coming from the wind plants. So about half. So we, about half the wind plants were running about half capacity, and that was due to basically what was available for wind. It wasn't a real windy night, but there was some wind there, so we do that. So, so there was contributions there um, in uh, in the winter time. So then you say, yeah, but and one of the issues that also happens in the winter time, and we didn't see it this year, we saw it the year before. One of the problems with solar is called snow. Okay, and when there was a lot of snow two years ago, some of you probably were here, so a lot of you weren't here yet. Two years ago, we had a lot of snow. The problem is for weeks on time. None of the solar plants didn't generate anything because there was snow on all the panels. And until the snows either slid off, or we had enough warm days, so they melted off, we didn't get anything from the solar. 
So that so that's something you got to keep in mind. That's a technical problem. Someone's gonna have to figure out. I keep saying that's an economic development issue for high school students getting brooms and stop rushing off all the stuff. I mean, literally, I mean, probably somebody some economics to actually be able to pay people to go and sweep off the snow off this uh, off the PV um, um, panels so that we can use some of the energy. But that's something we have to do. <laughs> that's something we have a big snowstorm. Um, so let's look at the summertime. So on the in the summertime. The peak traditionally, so I've been in the industry over 30 years, you can set your clock to the summer peak. Third day of a heat wave, two o'clock in the afternoon. That is when the most electricity is used. First day people say, oh, it's kind of hot, but we can get through one day. Second day, this is, hey, go up and get the air conditioning, get out of this. Uh, by the third day, turn it on, we're leaving it on, even when we go to work, because I'm sick of the heat, all right? So literally, you can always set your clock, two o'clock in the afternoon, that was gonna be the peak on the third day of a heat wave. Not anymore. That, throw that, everything here that I've learned, throw it out the window. And when is the peak usage in the summertime when it's fine? When the sun goes down. Okay, now, 8 o'clock at night, right? Nice, sunny, hot, humid day, right? The load is about a little less than 1,000 megawatts, which is interesting because it's like 100, and I'll show you later, it's about 140 megawatts of solar in there on top of that, which is uh, on, makes it higher. So we were over 1,000 megawatts. And... Um, during that time, so the sun comes, 8 o'clock, sun goes down, all the solar shuts off at the same time. All shuts off at the same time. Within 15 minutes, all the solar shuts down. The sun goes down at the same time, pretty much all across the morning. So what happens at 8 o'clock? So, so the sun goes down, everybody's rooftop solar turns off, everybody's electric use suddenly looks like it's really high because all of a sudden now you're using all the power from the grid. Okay, 8 o'clock, peak in the state. What's running to supply that state power? Um, one, one biomass plant, basically, right? And there was no wind that night. Nice, still, hot, humid, hanging in there, the humidity, no wind. So that's a problem. So if you really look at it, we're, we're importing more than 90% of our power from outside the state. That's coming primarily from gas-fired power plants in southern New England and from the Seabrook nuclear power plant, Millstone 3 nuclear power plant. That's where that power is coming from. Uh, 200 megawatts is going to still come from Canada. We're still getting some from Canada, but that's a small component of that, right? I realize that the idea that the peak load is now is after dark in the summer is a really different is different um, concept. Okay, offices have shut down at eight o'clock. The law school is pretty much you know is starting to shut down. The air conditioning is shut down, and we're still hitting the peak afterwards after dark. So what does this mean? So what this chart is 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 a sunny day and a cloudy day. Okay, so this is a 24-hour um, timeline, okay, and uh, it starts at midnight and it goes to midnight again. So people get up and, and um, I'm going to talk first about the red line. So nice sunny day in March, the end of March, which is a really good time for solar, kind of maximum solar is April, May, June. So the sun comes up. Um, sun, the people wake up, they start turning on things, taking showers, doing everything they're going to do around the house, starting to make breakfast before they go. And you can see the electrical load, which is the axis here, starts picking up. People wake up and start using electricity. So that ramps right up. And the sun comes up. All the solar starts kicking in. Oh, awesome. Look at the red line, what happens in the middle of the afternoon. It go, continues to go down. That is very unusual, but that's all from the solar. The solar is cranking in the middle of the afternoon. Everyone is reducing all the electrical demand because the solar is using it at the rooftops or in the neighborhoods or the one we have out front here. That's cranking using generation, and it's, it's reducing the load, the electrical load that people are using consuming the electricity. It's a great thing, but it goes down. That's very unusual. Okay, and then what happens when the sun goes down? Electrical load goes back up, and you can see the peak over there about eight o'clock again, okay? That was a sunny day in March. Now in March, I'll be honest, the load is low. People don't have water air conditioning. Nobody's running air conditioning in March. So it's a typically a low consumption period of time in March. It's not in the middle of the summer. But the nice thing about this, the reason I like this chart so much is the next day it rained. The next day it was rainy and overcast and that's where the blue line is. So the same thing, people get up, have breakfast, Guess what? And that stays in. There is still some solar that comes from the panels in overcast. This is not great, but you do get some out of it. So it's not like you can't have some contribution. And you see a little bit of a dip. 
but uh, but that line, that that difference of 140 megawatts is what we calculated is got, was from the solar that from a sunny day to a cloudy day. Now, if you have three or four days of cloudy weather, then you know that could potentially be an issue. But um, so I wanted to show you the major difference. And if you're trying to run the power system, which curve do you want to use the next day? And you're worried about how much generation you're going to have the next day. You have to be able to predict which one of those curves you want to use. Okay? You, and hopefully, you'll, and I'll talk about that, how accurate you want to be on that. So that's, um, you won't find that in a lot of places, to that type of, that's just one day of difference. All right, so how do we stack up versus the rest of New England? How is Vermont, in Vermont, many cases, has more percentage of renewables than any other state in, in New England. So what I've done is superpose a similar curve, a different day, same day, to um, what goes on in the rest of New England versus Vermont. Now they're on different scales, because Vermont's a little, you know, 1,000 megawatts compared to the rest of New England at, and this day was 16, 17,000 megawatts. So we're just a small component of all of New England. But the curves are very interesting. So then this day, we, you know, same thing that came up in the morning, and then around 7, 7.30, sun comes up, and then it drops down, and uh, then it goes back up. And we figured this day, and this was, um, we had about 75 megawatts of solar running. There was some overhead, some clouds, high clouds and stuff. It wasn't perfect. Uh, day. And then if you look at the shape, that was about 10% of our load coming from solar. And then the rest of New England, we figured it was about 5%. So we are ahead of the rest of New England. Massachusetts has the most solar, but it, it's a, most of the energy used in New England is in Massachusetts. So even though they have a lot more than we do, on a percentage basis, it's still kind of low. In Boston itself, the greater Boston area is about 22% of all of the energy consumed in New England is consumed in Boston. Okay. So one of the points to make when you think of um, policy statements on renewables is if 20% of all of New England's load is consumed within Boston, so most of you have probably been to Boston, there isn't a lot of land that puts solar, okay? You're not gonna find big fields in Boston to put a whole lot of solar in. There'll be a lot of places to stick it here and there, but you need a lot of acreage you're not gonna find in Boston. So what does that mean? That means renewables will be places where there's land and it's going to have to be bussed into Boston at some point in time. How's it gonna get there? The transmission system. So some people said, we are going to need a transmission system if we have renewables. Except in the cities, there isn't enough room for renewables. The so renewables will be somewhere else, and you're going to have to bring it into the cities, and that's where the transmission system becomes a critical aspect of incorporating renewable energy policy. Because you're going to get it from where you're going to make it to where people use it. Okay? So this is a chart developed by ISO New England. They have the system operated for New England. They schedule all the generation. They figure out, you know, they have to measure, uh, match the generation the next day with how many electricity people are going to use, make sure the right plants are running. And they're predicting, and this is basically the solar forecast for them for the next few years. Um, this as well. And it's by state. So the Vermont is green at the top. And uh, you can see there's, um, Massachusetts has a big component of that, which is the, the medium blue. Uh, but I'll tell you the Vermont number is too low. I know it's too low. They did a bunch of things to normalize it, but uh, we know that's it, it, it's good, but it's not exactly what's going to happen here. There'll be more solar even in Vermont than we're predicting here. Um, but this is a measure of our energy uh, that's going on. Now, one point I want to make is they're even saying by 2025 is um, 3,000, a little over 3,000 megawatts. So the peak load in New England is about 27,000 megawatts. So they're saying over the next 10 years, we're going to maybe hit 3,000. So you still, it's only 10% of your total energy demand. And remember, it's only during the day when the sun's shining and no snow on the panels. So, so the issue is we've got to keep getting expansion of, you know, how we can better use, utilize the solar impact. So the impact, so what it does, so we put the solar in, we have it here, we have it on our rooftops, we have big plants. Some, in some cases, 20 megawatt plants be in site in Vermont. You have uh, many, many that are two megawatts, which two megawatts is about 12 acres worth of it. 12 acres for two megawatts. That's that's a lot of land um, to do that. And those are springing up all over the state. Just drive around and can't miss them. And um, so what does it do to the power system, right? 
So it increases the complexity of running the, the plants, uh, running the power system. So our operators in Rutland that watch what's going on in the transmission system at all times, their problem is, hey, when a cloud comes by, that changes things because the generation stopped all of a sudden. Um, what happens when the sun goes down and all that generation goes away all of a sudden at the same time? In many cases, the power is flowing back to the transmission system from the local houses. If they not, if that power is not being consumed locally, it'll eventually go back on the transmission system to be reallocated someplace else. Okay, this is fine until you know the sun goes down and then boom, it's gone over reverse really fast, and that creates some problems for the operators who sit there saying, "Whoa, I had it going one way, now it's all going the other way." How does that change our voltage? Do we have start having lights that have low voltage? Do we have flicker? Do we have problems in the systems? So they would spend about 15% of their time dealing with issues with clouds and wind. And I'll talk about wind in a minute, but wind's a big kind of big deal. One of the things they worry we worry about a lot is that if there is a problem on the transmission system, for example, we had a problem two weeks ago, it was in central New Hampshire. They saw it was a short circuit on a line in central New Hampshire. They saw it in Burlington, Vermont. The Global Foundries chip factory had a voltage sag that they saw in a bunch of their machines stripped off. And if you were up at quarter six in the morning, you would have seen the lights do really fast, a really fast, like, uh, on off. Or you, you would have noticed it if you were up at that time. So um, that was really quick, big impact. Now, the things that I worry about is if that happened in the middle of the afternoon, at 2 o'clock in the afternoon, every single solar panel is cranking full blast, and you have this quick perturbation that happens to the power system, and if it lasts more than a second and a half, every single one of those units trips off. Like that. And that can look like across New England, like losing the Seabrook nuclear power plant trip. Or in, New, in, in Vermont, it would be like losing the tide at Hydro Quebec. So it's kind of a big deal, but it happens all over the place. It's not isolated to one location. So those are the things that like people, geeks like me, worry about. So, um, so one of the things with renewables. So we talked about if we're dependent on the weather, we're so dependent upon the weather, we better know what's going to happen the next day. So how many of you trust the forecast for Saturday? It's Tuesday. Are you willing to bet your wedding that what the weather guy said Saturday is absolutely going to happen? I don't think so, right? So the forecast when you go five days, like five to ten percent accurate. Okay. I need to know. I want to know tomorrow where the sun's going to shine, where the wind's going to blow, very accurately, so I can predict what, how much solar is going to run tomorrow. Now, this gets really amplified even more importantly if you're the guy sitting in Holyoke, Massachusetts, and you're running an auction at 3 o'clock today for tomorrow. And what they do is they say, hey, they run this auction that says, I need X number of megawatts of power tomorrow. And by the way, I need a little more for margin just in case something happens like Seabrook trips off or Hydro Quebec line trips off. Something else happens in one of the power plants, so I need a little extra. So I'm going to contract for you this much plus this much. And um, so they go out to bid, everybody says, I'll pay this much, I'll give you this much, I'll pay this much. And the highest guy, that have, they stack it all up, so many megawatts for this price. So they get to the, to the limit. So okay, I got to 25,000, that's good, and the price was this. That price sets everybody below that. Now the wind guys charge zero, hydro guys may not charge much. So a lot of the, you know, they get paid whatever the market, the highest market price for that hour sets everyone. And they do that bid hour by hour, for the next day. Now, if you have no idea what the really what the weather's going to be the next day, what do you do? You buy a lot of extra that you don't need. You pay for it whether you use it or not. So if you're not sure what the weather's going to be tomorrow, you're going to say, oh my god, I can't have a blackout, so we're going to pay extra. Just to make sure, because they all get fired if there's a blackout, so they're going to make sure they don't get fired, so they're going to make sure we're going to get a little extra. We all paid for that extra. But if we can accurately predict the weather for the wind and for the solar much better, then they said, well, it's not too conservative. But I have a lot of confidence in my modeling, then I'll be able to reduce that. Okay? But I don't necessarily trust that the wind's going to blow when they say somebody's going to tell me that. 
So what we've done in Vermont here, which is a little bit unique, is that we funded a project with IBM Research to basically look at very accurate weather predictions. And this is um, kind of cutting edge technology that we do to look at, be able to predict that, and what does it mean for the power system. So we took a weather product that IBM has done, and by the way, IBM now does weather.com's weather in the back, that has the back room of weather.com, so a lot of the stuff is based on the, uh, the, one of their models that they use. IBM's big on weather. They have some geniuses on weather model. But what we said is that, that's great, um, but we need to take what the traditional, traditional weather forecasting is, and we need to make it much more granular and specific to Vermont. So we put 50 weather sites up, took all the weather sites from everywhere else and incorporated it into this deep thunder predictive weather model. And I'll talk a little bit about that, but it does 72 hours in advance, every 10 minute forecast, 10 minutes it forecasts. By location down to one, this says two, it's one square kilometer. So one square kilometer is basically the size of the campus here at Vermont Law School. Think about that one. All other weather models, every guy on TV, NOAA, everybody else who's a weather model, it's 16 square kilometers, which is larger than the town of Sharon's you know, geography. It's very big. Okay, and I'll show you the, the difference in a minute. And that makes a difference where clouds come. It makes a difference when wind is. And uh, so we can, we're predicting down every 10 minutes, three or four days ahead, down to the very small geography. And it's very accurate. It's amazingly accurate now. So it's cool. So we do that, and then we look at what's the demand going to be locally. And uh, a lot of electric demand is based on weather. You know, it's hot, cold, and stuff. That makes a big difference, so we can actually predict that now very accurately. And, um, and we're using those to model, to put those two things together to decide how to run the power system. So this little map here, that square, and this is actually in Rutland. And uh, this square is what all the weather models that you see on TV and on the internet, that square is that. Those little dots, that's what IBM predicts. It's a big difference. So if you look at this cell, and this was a, this was like a, a big thunderstorm, okay? It was directly inside that square. You could have missed it. Because it, 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 it's doing its overall thing, but we actually knew exactly where we were. Our predictive models would have picked that up. And I'll show you. Um, so this is, was a, um, a, a line of thunderstorms that was coming through, okay? Um, and when that line of thunderstorms was coming through, the circle on the left-hand side, this was the predictive model, was saying that, geez, there's going to be a lot of thunder and lightning in this area. This was done the day before, saying that this is the area we're going to have problems. The one on the right basically shows the problems that Green Mountain Power Company had for electrical outages due to the lightning. So weather impacts the distribution companies, trees fall over, branches come down, lightning strikes, which impacts power outages. So it's a pretty good correlation between what we forecast and what happened. So the distribution companies got a huge value of better weather forecasting too. Um, so in doing this thing, we we be able to we are able to for next day ahead predict solar ninety five percent accuracy. So. Um, the solar panels that are outside of the law school, we're able to act within 95% accuracy next day ahead, 10 minutes, every 10 minutes, predict how much generation is going to be there now. Before, the best you could do was in the 80s. We get it up to 95%. That's huge. That's really, really important. Now you're starting to trust that we know that's going to work on this time at 2 o'clock in the afternoon. That would be generating. And on the wind, we get 93% accuracy. One of the unique things about wind in Vermont, it's not the same as the Midwest. The Midwest wind tends to be more steady because they have the plains, there's not a lot of things. Well, we, have, we have a lot of mountains here. So we have a lot of gusts in our wind. And some of that's due to sun that's heating up air in the valleys and that's coming up, in, 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 impacting um, the, um, the wind gusts that happen at the wind farms in Vermont versus just a steady, a steady wind. So it gets mixed up in there, and when it gets mixed up in there, you know, the wind, the wind farms tend to be a little bit more spiky, which I'll show you a complicated chart, but it's not, I mean, the solar stuff is pretty steady, the wind is less than steady, it's very variable, and it changes 
instantaneously. It's amazing how much a wind farm is not a reliable, steady generation source. So this is a chart. Don't get scared by it, but, but this is a chart that compares the solar weather forecasting from our IBM product versus the National Weather Service, right? Everybody trusts NOAA, right? Everybody else bases most of their things on it. So basically, and then what we did is we measured the solar from a certain, um, certain panels that we used as a benchmark. So the blue lines here are what the actual generation was. The black one is what NOAA said it should have been. So look at a couple of days here. And these are multiple days, right? In the part where it's at zero is at night. So it's, you know, one, two, three, four, five, five days, okay? So NOAA had said on the first day that there was going to be a gener way up high generation in the state of Vermont. Guess what? It didn't happen, okay? It was much lower than that, but our model showed it was going to be lower. If we had predicted, if we had used the NOAA weather forecast, we'd be totally wrong. We are counting on solar that didn't happen. That's a bad thing. So uh, that's kind of a bad thing. And then the middle day is not too bad. And then when you go to the fourth day, same same thing. High predicts Noah said it was going to be a lot of generation from solar because it was going to be sunny. It wasn't. The IBM model was more accurate compared to what actually happened. This is like really fascinating data. And why the, and I explain why this is so important. So if you're wrong, you can either have black or you pay too much money to take it back. So. Um, so wind, so moving from solar over to wind a little bit. So we have three, uh, I'll call, more significant wind farms in Vermont um, installed kind of in three locations. It's about 13% of installed generation. Um, the issue, the good thing is wind blows 24-7. It's not like solar that goes down when the sun goes down. So wind does blow. Um, some of the wind farms, though, uh, electrically have a hard time getting its power out, so that's constrained. That's a problem. 13% of the time, we have to turn off the wind farms because they can't get the power out. The developers of those wind farms did not pay the transmission system to export their power out of their area all the time. That's a problem. My sense is that's going to be a public policy decision that Vermont is that I'm going to work with the state and try to figure out. If you want to get the power out there all the time, somebody's going to build something, a transmission line or something to get it out of the area. And somebody's going to figure out who pays for it. Right now, the rest of New England will not pay for it. Um, the rules are not, you know, you don't have, you don't pay a developer's transmission cost. They have to pay that themselves, and they chose not to. So 13% of the time, we have to turn off wind, which is really a bad thing. You hate the waste. You hate to waste free energy. But right now, eventually, and my sense over the next couple of years, I'll get resolved with with um, policies and there is some mechanisms to do these type of projects now from the, on the federal level. So we're gonna probably part, um, look at that, okay? But the issue about who pays for that and, um, is a big deal. So this is a really complicated thing, don't freak out. Look at the green, look at the green chart in the middle. That's the one, the green line in the middle is the one I wanna point to. That is the output of a, the wind farm, uh, Kingdom Wind, which is up in, um, uh, the north, the northeast kingdom, but kind of. Um, so if you look at that wind, that doesn't look too steady to me. It's all over the place. That's all the gusts of the wind going up and down. So that's the megawatts coming out of the wind farm. So it's not steady. Engineers like steady, because if it isn't steady, so those of you who take my class know this. Um, the way electricity works is electrons go at the speed of light. At all times, you cannot create or destroy energy. So every, all the megawatts being used need to be generated instantaneously at the same time. They have to be in balance. When they're out of balance, it's called a blackout. Okay? So they have to be in balance all the time. The guys who sit in Holyoke, Massachusetts, do their whole thing is balancing that. Do I have enough generation compared to what people are using all the time, instantaneously? You have some automatic systems there, but that's the big, that's the game. Balancing those, exactly, balancing them all the time. The problem is when you have generation that looks like that, and you, maybe you can't count on it because that, that makes it harder. Not impossible, just harder. That's all. More challenges, give the engineer something to worry about. So, so, that is, so that is the issue. That's a big impact because it's variable. It's not like, hey, I want to do 200 megawatts. You know, fire it up 200 megawatts you know, from your gas plant or your gas turbine or uh, hydro plan or whatever, just do it and stay there. 
You can't tell the wind to stay there. It doesn't stay there. It's a problem. So what happens is that when that variable goes up and down like that, it, it plays havoc to the voltage, which has to be regulated. So the voltage is the 120 volts that come out of your outlet here. Okay, You have to regulate that. It has to stay within bandwidth. It's amazing how the computers don't like to work at 50 volts. But it's important that it all stays around the same bandwidth. So what happens if you have wind generation that's going like this and changing voltages, Okay, the power system can be fluctuating up and down. And that's a bad thing. So as grid operators, we have to control that. And we do that with a lot of technology and a lot of big devices to do that. So this list is a list of types of devices. Power electronics are several of them. The top five are the synchronous condensers, a huge motor. It's just a big motor that's connected to nothing. And all it does is regulate voltage. OK? Those are big. They are uh, located um, up in Williamstown. And uh, we have some transformers, phase shift and transformers. What that does is it keeps the power out of Vermont or lets it come in. And those are strategically located around the borders. Um, there's some up, up, up on the border north of Burlington that's coming from New York, saying, I don't want too much power coming through from Vermont, so we push it back. Same thing as this some right over here which is from New Hampshire, there's a bunch of hydro there. Either we want more or we want less to come, and that's how we control flow into the state of Vermont. That's a, a unique way to do that. So we do some of those type of things. And we have other ways to control voltage. And we are installing a new one um, in licensing, which is a static bar compensator, which is a power electronics device to control voltage very fast. Though. So it can help compensate for the wind variations. This thing's really fast and can counteract the fact that the wind keeps going up and down. So in kind of in, in summary, um, our net metering is about 15% of the load in Vermont, which is great during the day. Um, it's going to be a lot more than that. Um, there's a lot more plants being scheduled. And there's a lot more larger plants being built. And uh, PV, my sense, will be way over 25%. In the middle of the day, our energy is going to come from solar. It's great. It's a great thing, right? Um, but the changes in the system is now we worry about when the sun goes down. When we didn't used to, we used to worry about when the sun out. Now we worry about when the sun goes down. This is different. We, the good thing is there's very little carbon generation in the state. The bad news is there's very little generation in the state. We rely on our neighbors. Okay, it's a long way from the secret nuclear, secret nuclear plant to get to Vermont. And there's only a few transmission paths to get there. Out of our control completely. If something blows up in New Hampshire, that's, that can become a problem for us. So I worry about things like that because I don't have control over those transmission lines. But we totally rely on power from somebody else. We don't have enough in the state to do that anymore. So that, that, that's, some, uh, that's an issue for me. And I worry very much with the fact that with the wind and the clouds come by, how it changes our voltage, which is a huge issue for the state. And it's what, because we don't have any generation, it's an important thing. And that's one of our technical issues that our engineers work on all the time. And we'll probably do some more projects to kind of keep that voltage control because we don't have any. If you have generators in the state, that helps stabilize it, but we don't have any. So we're kind of the, if you think of it, we're the tail wag and the dog. We're at the very end of the line. We're the last guys there. So whatever happens before it gets to us can impact us. So that's all. That was kind of my presentation on the impact of that. Be happy to answer any questions anybody has on, on that, on my talk or any other thoughts. Yes. I was going to ask what you thought would be the next uh, step in energy storage. You think it's going to be ultra high vo um, high voltage batteries or flywheels or superconductors? So um, I did a study last year on batteries, um, looking at how to help the wind problem. Can I store the wind from uh, the wind farms and store it and take it out later when the transmission system would take it? And uh, the payback was 400 years. Um, I couldn't. I couldn't get the economics look anywhere close. I wish I could have made it better, but I couldn't. Um, so when we talk about storage devices, there's many types of storage technologies. There's like 30 different types. Um, one that uh, old tried and true one is stored water, right? Pump storage hydro is is one. There's two plants in Vermont. I mean, New England, both in Western Massachusetts, where they pump water up a mountain and they let it run down. And when they have plenty of energy, they pump it back up. And that's nice because when you have problems, you can you can store a lot of energy. And I might say, why? One of the plants is um, 800 megawatts. 
runs like almost a thousand megawatts. So those those are big storage devices. You talk about batteries, okay? Batteries, some, there's multiple battery technologies. There's no one. There's multiple ones, and they do different things. Different batteries for different reasons. Same thing as AAA batteries, C batteries, D batteries. They all have different purposes. Same thing with batteries. There's, you know, there's um, lithium-ion batteries that Tesla uses in its cars that has one battery characteristic. Good for short duration, really fast, pump it back into the system, charge really fast, it's really good. But if you need it for hours, not so good. Really expensive, need a lot of them, that's a problem. What else? Like batteries have a different characteristic. Good at slow discharge and slow charging. There's a thing called flow batteries, where you take two big buckets of, of types of fluids that have um, electrolytes in them. And you take these things and you pump them through a membrane. And when you pump these two dissimilar uh, fluids through a membrane, it actually generates electricity. And it goes back in the tank. It's really cool because you can store a bigger tank, you can store a lot of power for a long time. Still, there's only one commercially available plant now that's coming of full batteries. From a utility perspective, I kind of like that idea because I can store a lot of power there and I don't need it fast. So it's different flavors for batteries for different things. In Rutland, Vermont, GMP, Fremont Power has a DOE project that has two different types of batteries um, at the high school next to a solar plant where they're storing some of the solar energy in their batteries to use in emergency situations. And they also are doing some things on the market side with it. Um, right now, battery storage um, gets a lot of talk and a lot of press. The economics is questionable. The, the biggest place for um, um, most of the storage uh, applications, besides research projects, and there's a lot of those, is in Texas as well, where they have a lot of wind, and it's in California. The biggest market for storage in California, why? Uh, the reason that it, it, it's important in California is that if we were to go back to that my little curve, at 8 o'clock what goes down, what happens? California has the highest, sort of Hawaii has the most solar in Southern California than anywhere. And what happens when the sun goes down? It all turns off at the same time. And in 2020, a study was done was predicting that by 2020, when the sun went down, there'd be a blackout because there was no known generators that could compensate for the solar turning off and the other generation sources picking up the load. So what's happening when the sun goes down is a transition from solar generation to some other kind of generator. So as the megawatts go down, if we have to keep everything in balance between load and generation, somebody's pouring more fuel into some other device to, to, to generate that, uh, to serve those customers from the fact that the solar is going away and the sun's going down. So that transition is really important. And in California, it was so rapid, so much solar was turning off, there was no known way to pick up that, that generation that fast. Combustion turbines, which is typically what would have been used, would not do it because it takes a little time for the metals to heat up and you would break them if you tried to do it. So. The state of California said, well, we have to do something for an hour or so till these other technologies could pick up. So they issued um, an RFP to both utilities and to developers looking for 1,300 megawatts worth of storage devices to get you through that hour of transition when the sun's starting to go down before the other power plants can pick it up. So they issued a, an RFP and they're awarding lots of projects of storage to cover that one hour. Because that's all you need. You need a battery for that one hour, and then you know, and then all the other plants come back up. It's all good. So it's perfect for batteries. Uh, to be honest, that's an ideal uh, uh, thought for a battery to cover you just an hour, and you can have those all around. So that's one of the things. That's why kind of you hear a lot about it. But it's a lot of focus on California, and tons of research being done by DOE and other research areas for storage because they're really trying to a get the battery cost down. And then secondly, you're going to look at what makes sense. I've done a couple of studies looking at the economics and storage to see if we can figure out a way. Not quite there yet. Five years could be totally different. We could be storing stuff. But just remember one thing about solar and storage. If you take that solar that you're going to store in maybe eight to ten hours and put it in a battery and take it out at night, then that solar is not going to help you during the day because it's going to be stored. So you need your normal 
batteries for your normal load during the day, plus you have to have extra just to put away and store away. And the math doesn't always work if you go two or three days with no sun. So, you know, you need a lot. So, so this, the, so yes, I'm sorry. So a follow up on that, what about this power wall project with g and um, some people have signed up for it. Um, Tesla has one of the models, has discontinued one of their models. I think the 2500, they stopped making or stopped producing. Um, they didn't have enough people to take it up. It's, it was, um, um, they have other one, other power walls that they still do, but one of the ones they stopped making. Um, economics were kind of tough on the power wall. Um, originally, now I think the more marketing is for emergency, um, you know, emergency if you lose power. Um, but remember, it's pretty small. You're gonna run your refrigerator, maybe, maybe a couple other things for a day. So it's not, um, it's not that, it's not that big. It's 2,500 watts for just a few hours. So, so you just spell it out. Um, but that's a program it's, that this that GMP offers to do that. Um, but in California, it's very common to have those, and they couple them with the store with the charging of the electric vehicles. So the idea, and they have a different rate structure than we do here. Um, so the idea would be to be able to have, use your power wall to charge your vehicle whenever you want to charge it, versus paying you know higher rates at different times. So there's a whole thing, and, and it's a totally different thing in, in like Hawaii. Uh, I'll be honest, that's a whole different, uh, you know, what goes on with the concentration of solar in a place like Hawaii is a, so we have so far in this part of the U.S. to, to get from there. Uh, to, to get to that level. So that's the issue. A lot of people are interested in it. There haven't been too many uptakers of, of buying them right now. Yes? What's the issue with the thirteen percent loss in uh, in wind campaigning? Is it a uh, sort of a capital issue with the cost of the transmission lines together or yeah. is it an operational issue with the cost of all of No, it's not a cost thing, it's the fact is the power can't get out reliably. So um, that's the issue. The lines aren't big enough to take it at that time of year, and they have to be shut down because they didn't pay for that. They upgraded those lines. All right. Well, it's about the end of my time. Thank you very much for having me. Thank Appreciate you. it. Thank you for being here.